Today, I am very excited to be talking with Dr. Andrew Gallimore. Now, Andrew is a computational neurobiologist, a pharmacologist, chemist, and the author of a number of articles and research papers on the subject of DMT. Together with Dr. Rick Strassman, Andrew developed a protocol for the controlled prolonged intravenous infusion of DMT, which is known as DMT-X. And this allows a subject to stay in hyperspace for an extended period of time. His current work focuses on DMT as a tool for gating access to extra dimensional realities. And he talks about this and many other psychedelic substances in his latest book, Reality Switch Technologies. Now we go into all these topics here, as well as discussing how DMT is present prenatally in human fetuses, how it might explain near death experiences and what we know about endogenous DMT. And if all that wasn't enough, we also cover aliens, entities, hyperspace, and anything else you can think of relating to this extraordinary experience. So yeah, I think it's pretty obvious as to why I was excited to have this talk with Andrew. I mean, it all just happened a couple of hours ago. I am still completely buzzing from it. So without any further ado, I bring you Dr. Andrew Gallimore. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd kick this off with, I saw that when I was watching a few of your videos on uh, YouTube, you had a bit of a flair for kind of setting up the topic, bit of an icebreaker by having like a personal anecdote, which you like segue into the main discussion. So I thought mm -hmm. I would take, I'd follow that pattern and share one of my own. So here we go. Absolutely true story. So my older brother is also called Andrew and mm. it was big brother Andrew who was the person who was responsible for introducing me to psychedelics. And uh, yeah, bit of a shockingly early age, uh, I might add. So I'm not endorsing uh, that aspect, but it was, I was around about 13 and uh, he wow. sort of pushed, he was like a, quite a few years older and he sort of gave me a tab of LSD and said, try this bro, it's absolutely amazing, just try this. And he was, he was completely correct, it absolutely blew my mind. But basically that event set in the kind of wheels in motion for this event, because here I am 30 years later with another Andrew, who I'm hoping is similarly going to blow my mind. And yeah, I was kind of thinking, is this like a coincidence? You know, I think not. You know, I was wondering, is there some kind of like league of Andrews out there? Like sort of a secret cabal of like hyperdimensional interlopers, a bit like sort of from Rick and Morty, like the Legion of Ricks. So yeah, I just want to kind of put that out to you, Andrew. Is this, is this a coincidence? Anything you want to confess, Andrew? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't really know how to respond to that. I think um, I I got into psychedelics older than that. I mean, 13, that is kind of young. Um, I was doing other things at the age of 13. But um, uh, I got into psychedelics probably... When I was a teenager, certainly. I certainly became mm. interested in them as a teenager, as I was kind of thinking about university and what are we going to do with our lives, that kind of thing. And um, for some reason, I, when I was really, really young, I was interested in the occult. I was interested in ghosts and vampires and werewolves. My, my bro I have four brothers, two older brothers and two younger brothers. Um, and the older ones used to mock me for believing in werewolves and <laughs> vampires you know i used to make little kits like vampire mm -hmm. ward off vampires a little box had a little cross in it and some garlic and a little tiny steak <laughs> uh, that kind of thing um was it, yeah was so there I, any like uh, particular particular strand of like the vampire law that you were, were you were kind of like a, a, a twilight person or a bram stoker person or no not really i was i was interested in kind of the the folklore um, hmm. surrounding vampirism and, and uh, yeah, and, and people turning into, you know, ly lycanthropy, people turning into other beings um, by night, um, that kind of thing. And that kind of morphed as I, I got a little bit older, into, as I got sort of 16, 17, I, I became more interested in um, what's going on inside the head uh, and how we can... Um, use certain molecules to change the structure and the dynamics of our reality and that kind of fascinated me so that i kind of dived into studying chemistry and, and drugs basically pharmacology so this was the 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 birth of the internet so this would have been 96 mm. um so we didn't have the internet at our house at that time I, but at the school where i was they had an internet they had a you know just one internet and you had to get, you had to go and get the cable the, the, there was the only one back in 96 that's it <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, he had to go and get the cable from the IT man. I forget his name, which I remember. Uh, and he changed the password every day um, to, to log on. And, and I would go on there and I would search for DMT. This was, I first re- I heard about this drug in a book in my friend's house when I was 15, 16. Uh, and it just said this drug DMT. It's like LSD, but it only lasts 15 minutes. And I thought that's cool. Um, so I, I, my next job was to find out what DMT stood for. So I went to the local library and, and a book of acronyms and abbreviations and I found DMT, dimethyl terephthalate, which is plastic. It's a type of plastic. <laughs> so I was completely, completely <laughs> off there. Uh, for a while I thought that's what it was. Uh, and then when I finally got access to the internet, I started Googling, well not Googling, Alta Vista. I was Alta Vistaing. Back in there, that's going back, man. Um, yeah, I was Alta Vistering um, DMT, and I came across the Lyceum. Some of these old sites that pr- don't exist now. Hmm. Uh, the Lyceum Drug Information Center, I think it was called. I spent a lot of time on there. Each page took about ten minutes to load, but you know, I could spend a whole afternoon um, searching for information about these um, these these drugs. I just I just became obsessed with it. I started. Uh, buying seeds from a company called Of The Jungle in California. They would ship would, these sort of psychotropic, allegedly psychotropic plants and I would ship them and then I, I had this grow lamp in my bedroom and I was growing these these, these plants and, and trying them. Most of them didn't really do anything, uh, but it was, it was fun, you know, I loved it. And then a friend of mine came to school one day um, and he had a magazine and on the back cover of the magazine was an interview with this weird bearded guy called Terence McKenna, who you might have heard of. Um, and, um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and it mentioned, you know, his favorite drug. Uh, it, he says his favorite drug is DMT. Uh, and so that started that. So I knew then that I found something that um, was going to be the focus of my attention. And it has been really, uh, I became known at the, the later years of school as, as this kind of boy who was interested in drugs you know uh, and that that continued through to university when I went to study chemistry of course and pharmacology um, and maintained this interest in drugs um, then I went to Cambridge and did a PhD in biochemistry and then <clears throat> I've done postdoctoral work in neuroscience so I've kind of I think <clears throat> psychedelics there it, it, it's an interdisciplinary um, field in that you, you, you have to be a, something of a chemist, you have to be a bit of a pharmacologist, you have to be a neuroscientist, a little bit of a psychologist. This, it colours all of these things. So I've been spending the last 20 years or so um, kind of building myself up, learning all of these different disciplines. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, I started to actually spend more time writing about psychedelics. So I published a, a paper that got some attention and got me invited to some conferences uh, where I lectured uh, on on DMT and my ideas about it, and that's um, that's yeah, that's what I've been doing since. And now I'm in Tokyo, uh, all these years later, basically spending all of my time thinking and writing about um, psychedelics. And there we go. Well, to the well, present a day. Things that, yeah, a couple of things I'd like to like unpack there. First of all, I think it's it's fascinating how you know, it's, it's the, the cultural element that's kind of started you on, on this journey that you're, because first, I never heard of DMT until way, way later. It kind of, it kept landed on my radar. You know, here's one where I've got to tip my hat to, to Joe Rogan. It was kind of, it was that kind of, I was quite yeah, late yeah, to yeah. it in that regard. I was wondering, would, for you to be coming across like a character like Terence McKenna so earlier, I, I it, he was there in the background thing, but I didn't really realize it at first. Were you aware that, you know, he used to, did he used to do a lot of collaborations with The Shaman and stuff. Uh, if you were like part of like the rave scene, they're going through the 90s. But I kind of, I, I only realized afterwards that there was this this voice that was talking in the, back, in the background of a lot of rave tracks. And that was Terence McKenna. And again, it was mm. totally under my radar because I was just far too high on other things at, at, at the time to pay much attention. But I think it's, I find it like real interesting that, that this whole thing, this kind of psychedelic renaissance, which we, I think the perception is that it's fairly, um, maybe the last like 15 years or something, has actually had roots going a lot further back. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, as you say, Terence McKenna, he, 
he collaborated with a few different um, musical outfits. Mm. So el- this sort of electronic music and rave culture. He was very interested in that in the, that culture. Um, um, but of course, this was in, as you say, the early 90s. And perhaps, he, I mean, he really kind of appeared on the scene, I think, in the early 90s. But this was pre-internet, basically. Yeah. So you couldn't YouTube him. Um, if you wanted to listen to him, you either had to go to one of his con- uh, concerts, one of his lectures, or one of his talks, uh, or you could send off for tapes. They were selling tapes. So there's a, mm-hmm. a company called Dolphin Tapes uh, in the United States who, who would distribute uh, the recordings. So it wasn't that easy, actually, to um, to come across his voice, unless you just, as you say, you know, you were listening to that Shaman record or one or Alien Dream Time. There were a few mm-hmm. releases out there where he was, because he has this beautifully kind of nasal voice like this. You know, it's <laughs> very kind of evocative kind of voice, <laughs> hyperdimensional, um, that kind of thing. Um, so it's instantly recognizable now. You can you you wouldn't hear his voice and go, oh, who's that? You know, it's obvious when you hear Terence McKenna exactly who you're listening to. But at the time, I guess it wouldn't have been. It just would have been this cool character um, uh, narrating with this, you know, characteristically kind of baroque and um, um, kind of um, eloquent um, mm. rants and raves uh, about DMT and these machine elves and hyperdimensional realities and that kind of thing. Um, so, so certainly the, 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 the psychedelic renaissance, as we now call it, uh, has been uh, accelerated by the internet uh, and the fact that you can now go onto YouTube and, and find hundreds uh, of Terence McKenna lectures um, and there are other you know, podcasts that are broadcasting his lectures. So, um, you know, at the time I, I was buying his books, you know, I had to order special, you know, from the bookshop, True mm-hmm. Hallucination and Food of the Gods. That was the only thing that I could read about Terence McKenna. Apart from his website, of course, he had his website, which is still there, levity.org, I think, I think it is. I have ever visited that a lot. Um, Terence McKenna's Alchemical Garden at the Edge of Time, I think is what it's called. It's still all up there. I mean, it's very, I mean, he was a very early pioneer. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I remember you know, a lot of stuff on on VR that year when he was kind of way ahead of his time mm. with, uh, what's it what's called? Is it Jared Lanier, the sort of um, dreadlocked sort of tech guru guy? And so, yeah, he was Maybe. very sort of like engaged with these technologies. And I think he saw how they were going to affect us way before... They say, but while we were still asking the IT guy for the cable, he was like, "No, this is going to yes. be world changing." <laughs> so, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting when you, I've listened to him talking about it, and he, he, I remember once he spoke about his the speed of his modem, and he says, "Yeah, I've got this twenty five kilobits <laughs> per second modem running here," and it's like, "You never, never mention the speed of your modem because in twenty years it's going to sound ridiculous." <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's interesting. There's a bit of a segue, possibly there, in uh, in bit from bits to some of the stuff that we could talk about uh, with you with the uh, the contents of your books. And I think, yeah. just, I mean, interestingly as well, I think a comparison is worth making is that I think this is probably you know this is how most people have come across y- yourself, or or at least people at um, you know my kind of level outside of academia. And yeah, you know, I, I when I listen to a lot of your talks and a lot of others, I'd see like a, you know, the next generation of sort of Terence McKenna-esque sort of, you know, psychedelic rock stars. I don't know how sort of comfortable you are with that, that kind of label, but I mean it genuinely. And I think I think people like yourselves are needed to sort of be able to bridge that gap between the sort of, you know, the sort of academic science talk and kind of, you know, extrapolate the narrative into something else and that was one thing i, I that was the bit i really liked in alien formation theory but i did and that was kind of what i want to pick your brains about today mm. but because I, I, I would like i would have liked to have seen more of that and i think uh, you, you might be aware andrew but this is not actually the first time we've we've communicated online i, I back when i read alien formation theory i wrote a sort of a, a mini review of it online and I, and I don't want to sort of shy away from that gorilla in the room um i will offer a, a little bit of backstory um at the time at the time i read alien information theory um it was, it was it was christmas last year and i was staying with my in-laws uh for a week so i was in a pissy mood i was uh, uh <laughs> i was not the most re- receptive 
and I was really looking for some escapism and I was I, I would, like first of all I just want to say the layout of this book and the design I think it is a work of art I thought Thank I you. thought the experience of this book is amazing um, but I wanted more aliens Andrew I wanted uh, <laughs> Um, or, or, at least, or at least, at least more. I thought the last, the last like chapter where you we started going, it's like oh, I, I, my my little vampire fang was popping out. I, I wanted to, to more of that. Um, I'm currently on Reality Switch technology. I'm going to do a shameless plug for you here, Andrew. If my virtual Wait. camera will stop phasing things out. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm currently on Real Reality Switch technologies, but I'm only about I'd say about a quarter of the way through at the moment because I only received it a couple of weeks ago. So. Um, hopefully, I'll, yeah, I won't, I, I, my intention is not to make you try and repeat too much of, of the stuff that's in there, but certainly we'll use these as like a, uh, a launch pad to the sort of conversation. Um, mm. There was just something you, you, you said before, I just want to tap into when you, you, I could say it's, when you were talking about the, your fascination uh, with like horror films and, st and stuff like that, and these kind of transformations. Um, that's mm. something that I, I, I had a similar thing when I was a kid, but the thing that always fascinated me but absolutely terrified me was uh lycanthropy so transforming into um you know werewolves and stuff and that in doing so the person would lose themselves in that transformation but if you think like the very uh the classic one like american wolf in london if you've seen that the guys that go into cool. a very yeah. painful mm. and like loss of identity as this thing comes over and that's kind of i think you know certainly i think is the fear that gets tapped into with a lot of these psychedelic experiences, like this fear of losing yourself, of transforming into something that is not mm. quite me anymore. So I was wondering if that was like something that was kind of planted in there, or maybe there's something about psychedelic explorers that's kind of interested in this, these shifts of not just what you are seeing and these, you know, the, the experience being fed mm. to you, but the fundamental shift of like, I am becoming something else. Like, how do I feel about this? So I just wanted to, to yeah, just, Put a little a little flag in that, um, but yeah, I mean, let's talk about DMT, Andrew, because uh, this is this is, seems to be your area of expertise. And um, first, I, I think when I've watched some of your talks or when I've been reading your books, um, I mean, I think your your uh, scientific background and your passion and your enthusiasm for these subjects is obvious. But there's something that I thought I detected in there, which was uh, like a bit of and I mean, and I don't mean this in any kind of derogatory way at all. I think this is very good quality. A bit of playful mischief of sort of mm. wanting to, exp um, yeah, you know, just explore, explore these things, see where they go. I think it certainly comes across in um, sort of like the spark that lights up in your eye when you talk about these extended state uh, DMT things. So I kind of wanted to to go there a bit. But um, mm. so yeah, I think first of all, like as a as a good question, you I mean you covered like. Um, um, your, your, you know, your background of, of how you got here, but what do you think makes DMT so special? Like, what, what, why is it? Why are we talking about DMT rather than the other psychedelics? Um, well, for me, it's it's the most remarkable of the psychedelics for a number of reasons. So, even if you think about the molecule itself, this naturally occurring. The simplest, in my opinion, the simplest structurally of all of the naturally occurring psychedelics, two steps from uh, tryptophan. Um, you know, tryptophan goes to tryptamine, goes to dimethyltryptamine. So mm -hmm. it's it's extremely um, simple and it's ubiquitous. So it's everywhere you look. You know, you look out the window. There's probably half a dozen plants that contain DMT in varying concentrations. So we have this extremely common, uh, almost ubiquitous molecule that's found all over the place. Everywhere you look, there's DMT. Uh, Dennis McKenna always says, nature is drenched in DMT. <laughs> yes, uh, it, there's that much of it around. Um, and just coincidentally, uh, it also happens to be this extremely efficient reality channel switch um, within seconds of in, inhalation of the vapor, you are your normal waking world uh, is obliterated, and it is replaced with one that is bizarre, you know, altogether 
d different, altogether stranger, that bears no relationship whatsoever to our world, that emerges with ferocious intensity, with ferocious force. Uh, you're, you're hurtled into this um, populated realm, you know, filled with these intelligent beings that want to communicate with you. That, to me, is the most astonishing, just that fact, without actually having, even if you've never taken DMT, that fact alone, the people reporting instantaneous tra transportation to an, an alternate, highly complex, hyperdimensional reality filled with intelligent beings, communicative intelligent beings, really intelligent beings, like extremely powerful, hyper-intelligent entities. Uh, that in, in itself is, is astonishing. This simple molecule that you find everywhere just happens to be this such an efficient changer uh, of our subjective world, of the structure of our reality. Um, and it all happens so quickly. You know, the brain seems very, very comfortable in the presence of DMT. It's not hanging around. It's not sticking to receptors for long periods of time. It goes in. It causes these dramatic effects, really dramatic effects, you know, astonishing effects. And then you're dragged back out again. Um, to me, that's just um, that's a remarkable thing. Uh, and, and the fact that it is so ubiquitous, the fact that it is everywhere, this, ah, it, 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 it leads you, you know, it leads you on. It's like it, it, it's telling you something. There's some hidden message there uh, in the ubiquity of this simple molecule and its properties. It's not some rare chemical that's cooked up in the lab of some clandestine chemist. This is a, a very, very common, naturally occurring uh, psychedelic, the most common, I would say, by far naturally so, occurring psychedelic. So do you think that is like indicating some kind of bigger scheme to this rather than just this happens just by chance? The, the, the experience that you've just described of this kind of, you know, what we kind of mm. colloquially refer to as like this, this hyperspace, you, mm. you think this kind of factors into a, a bigger narrative of what we are supposed to do with these with these substances, how they mm. what they mean for our species, or yeah, how, how do you? How, how, I'm, I'm trying to get this. Like, yeah, what what is your belief here about what what is what is happening? Oh, I don't have a belief, and I'm always keen to point that is out. Is that a dirty word? I, I, Let I, me. Uh... Yeah, I think since you say I believe this, then people think that that's what you think is the truth, right? You, you, yeah, sure. Like, okay. It's almost like you're, you're a proponent of a particular religion or ideology, which sure. I've always kind of railed against. Okay, what would, your uh, hy I, what, what, what would be a possible hmm. hypothesis then? Well, I mean, you know, I'm certainly not the first person to consider the idea that, that there's some, there is some, at least minimally, it seems like there is some, some significance to the fact that, the, the, that this ubiquitous naturally occurring psychedelics just happens to be... Uh, or is um, this efficient reality channel switch? And it's very tempting to speculate um, why that is the case. You know, what's the connection here? Is was DMT somehow uh, implanted in our reality? This uh, in in the book Alien Information Theory, as you know, uh, towards the end, I do describe DMT as like an intelligence test. Mm. Um, in that it's everywhere, the message is everywhere, but it cannot be read until. The, the a species such as ourselves reaches a certain level of cognitive and technological uh, sophistication that they can identify this molecule, they can isolate it, they can purify it, and then they can learn how to use it. Uh, and so, this, and all of that takes a high level of intelligence. We're mm -hmm. certainly the only species, by far, on the planet that could actually uh, use DMT really i mean you can't just chew leaves um because it is orally inactive you have to isolate it certainly to get the full-blown uh, dmt reality switch experience you know complete transportation into this realm um, you need to isolate it you need to uh, purify it uh, to some degree at least uh, and then you need to learn how to to use it um and, and so it, it feels like the, it's the development of a technology in a way, and yeah. that's how I treat it. In that we are, we're kind of we're at the stage now as humans where we're beginning to see DMT as a technology, not just a drug, uh, not just a psychedelic, but as some technology for um, almost instantaneous communication with this uh, very very high level and much older 
a more sophisticated intelligence. Mm. And <clears throat> once you do that, once you begin to treat it as a technology, then you, you get away from um, a lot of the... Uh, I don't want to say new age, but there are there are a lot of things that kind of hold back treating DMT as a technology. People think uh, you need to sit on a, you know, a hand woven rug facing <laughs> east at the full moon, um, you know, and light incense and all of this stuff. And I don't have a problem with this kind of ritualistic aspect. Uh, and certainly I don't have an issue with more traditional uses of DMT in like ayahuasca, for example. Uh, I think these are all valuable uh, and should be protected. But... Um, I think we there's a danger in that people seem to think that injecting DMT, for example, using an infusion like I propose with, with Rick Strassman, is somehow um, desecration. You know, it's mm. a desecration of this this sacred uh, molecule. And I, but I, I think actually, if we do take seriously the idea that we could be um, communicating with some kind of intelligence wherever it is, whether it's somehow within our consciousness or whether it is actually some other orthogonal dimension of some sort um, it's not particularly diplomatic or respectful uh, to kind of burst through into their their world unbidden uh, uninvited uh, look around wide-eyed and go oh, look at this look at this look at this look at this and then bugger off again as we would say in the uk <laughs> right that's not particularly i don't think that's particularly respectful to the intelligence. So I think if we do treat it as potentially a tool for communicating with intelligence, then we should treat it like a, as a technology. We should bring our best tools to the table, I always say. Uh, and if that means uh, injecting somebody, uh, if that means plucking, hooking somebody up to a, an infusion device and delivering DMT into their brain at a, con uh, a consistent rate, then that's what we should be doing. Mm. We shouldn't be attached to the old ways and think that they, they're somehow the best. Because it's nonsensical, of course. Um, you know, extracting DMT from a plant is not a natural thing. You know, that is a technology. This is chemistry. Mm -hmm. That's what we do as humans. Um, so the idea that somehow that's okay, it's okay to extract it, but then you can only vape it with a little pipe. That's the only proper way to do it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, it sort of doesn't hold any water, that way of looking at DMT. Yeah, well, I would, uh, And so, you know, go on. Yeah, I was, yeah. was going to say, I, I to totally agree with that. I think there's, it's very easy to for people to say, yeah, like technology stopped here. So, so the, you know, anything else is, is, is like you say, disrespectful, um, yeah. sort of, it, it's we should we should just kind of keep it in in this realm. Um, I just wanted to um, unpack a couple of the the words that you use here because uh, I think mm. from uh, you know from reading your books, I, th I think it's, I've, I've got an idea of where it is that that you kind of you are on. Let's let's say the the spectrum of weirdness um, in terms of of, <laughs> of you know we're we're kind of oh, I'm trying to avoid the belief word. Um, yeah, yeah. But th there's a few words which I think might be sort of. Yeah, I think could could need a little bit more more unpacking. So, in particular, like when you refer to things like aliens or or reality, mm. um, because mm. I think for most people, um, or so, you know, within the psychedelic community, then they're kind of landing somewhere on the line of either this is a completely local experience that is happening um, due to you know chemicals acting on your brain, or that this is some kind of uh, you know, hyperdimensional portal that's been opening, and, and you are communicating, like like Jodie Foster, in contact to beings on the other side of the galaxy. And, yeah. and there's maybe a little bit of new age sort of stuff somewhere somewhere in the middle. And from what I gather from Yosef is, is um, there's a lot of stuff in there that seems to talk about this being localized effects. But as the, I think mm. it seems like the the localized universe you see is actually much bigger than. What's actually what we're we're interpreting? So we're getting we're getting a filtered version of a much bigger experience, which is so. Is it that what you are referring to as hyperspace, like the the unseen things that are going on around us? And in fact, that the fact that we that our whole three D kind of universe is actually just like a subset of a vast thing. So I was wondering if you could just unpack, like, what do you mean by reality? And when you're talking about like the possibility of communicating something. Like, w mm. what are these things, um, as it, it, like in, in the local or non-local way? Okay, there's a lot there. Mm. Um, let's, so, so, so I think the first 
you know, ever since I've been speaking about DMT, I've always, it's become something of my mantra, if you like. It's the only thing which I always insist upon it as almost like an, axi an axiom of my thinking, uh, which is that the world that you experience is constructed. Um, it's, it's informational structure and its dynamics are all represented in, in the brain. Mm. Um, so even the world you're experiencing now is all, in a sense, in your head. Your brain is constructing it. Yeah. However, it's also modulated uh, and informed by sensory information, by information from the environment, which the brain uses to, uh, to test, basically, its model. Uh, but the, model, the world that you experience is always in your head. So it's not... As people often say, is, that, oh, is the DMT world real or, or is it all in your head? It's always all in your head. Mm -hmm. uh, your brain is always constructing this model. So what this means is that this also applies in the DMT state, the, the DMT world, whatever its nature. In other words, whether you are truly communicating with some other intelligence, wherever that intelligence might be, or if it is purely fabricated by the brain. In both cases, it's built in exactly the same way. It's like if you dream of um, um, seeing a tiger. I speak about a tiger in reality switch technologies. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you dream about a tiger, um, the tiger is built in the same way in your brain as it is if you actually go to the zoo mm -hmm. and you see a, an actual tiger. You know, if you're hallucinating and you see a tiger in the corner of the room sleeping, um, even though the tiger isn't there as such, the model is there. You know, the model in, in your brain. It's just it doesn't it doesn't map to reality. It's not an adaptive model. It's not properly informed by sensory information. So that's really what a hallucination is. So though, so so going back to DMT, this means that the DMT worlds, whatever their nature, are always constructed by the brain. So the question then becomes not is it in your head or not, uh, but uh, is it being modulated by information from some other place so just like the world you know our normal waking world we consider to be real because it's modulated by sensory information it's constantly being tested against information from the environment mm -hmm. that's what we consider to be real um, now dmt then we, we ask the question is there some other place does dmt somehow gate access to information to the does it gate the flow of information from some other place which the brain then models as the DMT space. Um, that's the question here. Now, this naturally leads on then to if the DMT world, if there is some other place that the brain is receiving information from, you know, where is that other place? Is it some other dimension? Uh, as I talk about in alien information theory, is it some orthogonal dimension that our brain doesn't normally have access to, but does? Uh, for certain reasons when DMT enters in the brain? Is it uh, gating the flow of information from deep unconscious structures? People like this idea, mm. by the way, uh, and I don't discount it, uh, but it's often spoke, spoken about in a very kind of hand-waving way. People say, oh, it's, it's, it's from the unconscious mind. You know, what does that mean? You know, what, what is the structure of this unconscious mind? Or they say the collective unconscious. And again, there's a lot of bad... Um, woolly, loose thinking. So when you when you start talking about consciousness, particularly when you start talking about Jungian psychology, because most people don't really understand mm -hmm. it, what Jung was talking about when he said the collective unconscious or the personal unconscious. Uh, my next book actually is all about this, <clears throat> so I won't say too much about that. Uh, but I think, um, yeah, we that's really the the, the 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 most important question to answer is is where is the information coming from. Uh, that is being used to inform this model because your brain evolved to construct one model of the world right your brain evolved to construct this model of the environment and it took e evolutionary epochs uh, to achieve this it also takes all of your all of the, the from the moment you kind of emerge from the womb uh, your brain is is refining uh, this model um, so it's all through development all through experience your brain is refining its model of the world. So your brain only knows really how to construct one world, mm -hmm. or it should only know how to construct one world. And yet, when this simple molecule enters your brain, your brain suddenly, and with beautiful efficiency, begins constructing this 
bizarre hyper-technological reality that has no relationship. Nothing uh, from this world is taken into uh, this DMT world. It seems to be completely disjoint. It's a completely uh, unexpected, unpredictable, um, unanticipated uh, world. The, the, uh, and the fact that the brain can construct it so effortlessly um, in the presence of this molecule uh, is not easy to understand, no. right? Uh, it's not just enough to say, oh, it's, you're just hallucinating. Uh, you know, it's just your brain on drugs, man. Uh, you know, I hear that all the time, and it kind of it really annoys me because people <laughs> don't really understand the implications uh, of what's going on here. They don't understand how fucking wild it is that your brain is suddenly constructing these hyperdimensional realities mm. uh, when it's perturbed by this simple molecule. That it's an it's a remarkable thing. It's like um, I sometimes describe it as like a, like a young British child um, suddenly switching to speaking fluent Siberian Yupik, you know, or, or fluent Mandarin or something, having never been exposed to the language. It's like, well, where did he learn to speak that? Doesn't make any sense. This is inexplicable. It's the same kind of thing, but in terms of world building, the way that your brain constructs worlds. Yeah. So there's a couple of bits I just wanted to clarify, maybe for the audience, or, or, mm. or, or at least draw your attention so i think when you, you talk a lot around information coming in and I, I don't think what you're saying is is anything close to the kind of uh, the idea that we are res, um receiving you know this idea that we are t tvs receiving information so uh, if my understanding is correct there is a biological side going in we are generating information but then there is an under the influence of something like dnt there is a new stream of information which is being fed in as well is it am, am i on the right track there yes yeah, so that would be the case so so information so sensory information is you know, are these patterns of uh, electrochemical signals that enter via the eyes and the ears mm -hmm. and, and the skin etc uh, you know the the touch and the, the photoreceptors in the eye they 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 convert photon energy into electrochemical signals which then pass into the brain the brain then uses that information uh, to um, to modulate its model of the world to, to kind of test its model and check that its model is actually working. Um, and so, yes, the implication here would be if this DMT world is real, you're not going anywhere. That's the key point. You're not going to another world. Um, in fact, what's happening, so, you know, I, I always say you're not breaking through into another world, but the other world is breaking through into you. Mm. Yes, you are, it is taking over your brain's world building machinery uh, and it is building its world using your brain. That's the key here. It's a flow of information into your brain and then your brain uses that information to construct um, this model of that space, which we experience as the DMT world. Mm. And I think there's something else that you, you talk around in the book where it's, where it's not just the presence of information, but also the format of this information, or, or, or at least our, our ability to process that information becomes sort of increasing somewhere. And I think that the terms you use of this is like, or the example is this grid and hypergrid sort of idea mm. of uh, like, as I speak to you now, I am processing sort of information on a, you know, fairly flat plane, but then suddenly mm. these things were kind of like folded or stacked on top of each other. And then things are flowing in now in multiple directions, then my idea of what even isn't possible um, and the kind of the, the the worlds that are now available to be built become infinitely more complex and that that's kind of what, pretty much what happens uh, within the, the DMT experience and I would completely share your frustrations with, with the kind of like it's just a drug because it's mm. it doesn't fit the archetype of like things getting mushy or things things getting distorted right. it the level of complexity is like, it, it, I mean, it's hilariously funny how, com how complex it is because it's just, you just, you realize how uh, limited you are in the face of such complexity, uh, which is, which is yeah. truly, can be a truly startling experience. It is startling, you know, and, and you're right. It's not, it's, it's not like, um, sometimes you, I think of it like a, those, one of those old TV sets, mm. you know, with the, with the dial. Oh yeah, I had maybe. one of those. <laughs> Yeah, we had one in, in, in the kitchen in our house, a little black and white one. And, and when you turn the dial at first, you, could, you get kind of static and then the, 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 the screen, com the image completely breaks down and becomes noisy, right? There's the disorder. But then as you keep turning, suddenly 
you get this new channel crackles into view uh, because the the TV set is starting to receive information uh, on a different uh, on a different frequency basically uh, and it, it's that kind of thing it's it's not your brain isn't just creating it's not just becoming more chaotic more disordered that happens at first you get this increase in disorder and then it, it kind of it, it kind of settles into an entirely new pattern of activity, which is highly ordered. Uh, anyone who tells you the DMT world is disordered um, hasn't broken through properly because it is highly ordered. Yes, it's complex. Mm. It's astonishingly complex and apparently hyperdimensional, uh, but it, it's not disordered. It can feel like a disorderly experience and as, as you're kind of hurtled through these strange domains and everything's moving very, very quickly and fast and so much information, so much complexity, so much strangeness. Uh, but it's, I, n no one ever describes it as disordered um, or chaotic, and really. Um, what they describe is extremely high complexity. Mm -hmm. So it's a new order is, is emerging um, in, in the DM state state in the brain yeah. not uh, this I have heard sort of people and I've certainly even had this experience myself of it there, there can be I don't know if disordered would be the the, the accurate word for it but a sort of a, there's a feeling of uh, you know, um, increased anxiety and of being sort of a certain chaotic nature as though you're being as reality begins to frame it. and this is normally at the sort of the, the pre breakthrough sub breakthrough doses so I think once you get once yes. you hit the breakthrough, then it, 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 yeah, it becomes as ordered and complex as, as we described. But before that, while you're in this kind of in between space, it can be like, am I am I here or am I there? And some of the DMT mm. effects are kind of kicking in, so you get this can get these kind of parallel timelines feeling, but you're kind of sat there in your bedroom or something. So it can get these feelings of like, oh, where, where am, am I here? Am I there? Who am I? What am I? You know, and, and it can get very. Uh, strange which is why it's it's you know it you always it always gives this um thing of sounding like a bit of a like a lunatic but it's like you no know, you've got to go for the you've got to go for the big experience this is not something you can really yeah, yeah, tour yeah. dip into um but yeah i mean I, take the third hit man take the third hit terence knew, <laughs> knew what he was talking about so i mean i, I mean yeah like you said I mean, I, the language you use for describing this, this this world building machine i think he's um yeah, it very it very resonates with me because that is you, you have this fully featured, fleshed out world, often which seems like it's be, beyond the capabilities of your own imagination. So I, I guess then that kind of come, would come Certainly. to my question, like, like, it, it, do you think is this something that you think could be um, a switch that is being flipped? Like this is this is a biological piece of of like software or for you would it would it be like no this is a stream of data that is coming f f from yeah through some other other means um yeah so this is this that's the great question mm. right is is the brain actually capable of constructing these realities without input it's like when you when you go to sleep at night yeah you can you can have you have dreams everybody even when they say they don't they almost always do except in some very rare cases Everyone dreams, let's say, uh, and, and when you're dreaming, your brain is constructing these perfectly coherent world full of, you know, all five senses are intact uh, in most people's dreams. Um, it feels and is experienced just like the normal waking world in a sense, uh, for the most part. But it's all done without any sensory information input. Um, so the brain knows how to build a world, it knows mm -hmm. how to build what we call normally the consensus world, the, the world it has been, uh, it, it has evolved to build, the, the world it has been refining in, in its construction over these, over mi millions of years really, up to the, up to the, the modern day. Um, so your brain, you know, is perfectly happy in constructing the world, the world, right, um, without sensory information. So then the question is, um, well, is the brain also capable of constructing these completely different, extremely bizarre and complex worlds that have no relationship to our world. Um, if if you accept that, and that's what I struggle to accept, then you can say, okay, um, somehow DMT, it's perturbing this highly complex system that is our brain uh, and causing a new pattern of activity to emerge, which happens to appear like a highly complex um, alternate reality. 
some people might accept that. For me, it's I'm not so sure. Mm. It doesn't really make that much sense to me. Uh, on the other hand, um, if we do entertain the idea, at least, that we could be accessing some other other reality some other domain then yes then it starts to make sense then you can imagine that there is some flow of information that's en that's entering the brain uh, in the presence of dmt when dmt perturbs the brain it, it alters the patterns of neural activity such that it can begin to receive this information um it's 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 similar to or analogous to but it's not the same uh, as the idea of resonance and um, you can alter the structure of a, a metallic object and get it to ring mm. at a different frequency and then sound waves at that frequency will also make it ring you know you get this resonance effect so so you, if you imagine that in a much more complex way where the patterns of information being generated by the brain um, are in some way um, resonating again I use that word like mm -hmm. this because um, it's not really resonant but you but it at least gives you an idea of what's going on here that the brain can for, for some reason only begin to receive this information from elsewhere in the presence of DMT when the when the neural activity has been um, uh, highly specifically perturbed uh, by the presence of this molecule mm. I think as, as well as well as the the kind of the, the world of building that's going on that i mean there is a change in the experience uh, as well so I, you know it's it's I don't, it's not just a case of like putting on a vr set and experience something else the the some kind of it feels almost like some kind of like new sense or some new aspects of consciousness are being turned on and i think this is why i, I really liked your um talk of the sort of the, the grid and the hyper grid because it, yeah, information, is, it feels like it's flowing in a different way. There is stuff here that I can now comprehend, which was incomprehensible before. Um, mm. And it, so it's, yeah, the, the, whereas like personality-wise, I feel like that's, it's me. I don't feel, um, you know, clouded or, 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 or fuzzy or sort of drunken in any sort of way. It's completely me, but it's me 2.0 mm. uh, or, or probably me, 94.0 or something like that it's, it's many versions ahead of my uh, of my current operating system yeah so yeah i mean that that yeah. kind of that feel of uh information flowing i think orthogonally i think is how you described it um and in sort of much more complex yeah yeah I, I i am a um an it guy by uh by trade and career so i, I was i was i very much liked the sort of the stuff around uh conway's sort of game of life and and how you know, I thought your example of how those kind of in interactions, when sort of stacked into more complex things, give rise could give rise to yeah, incredibly uh, uh, complex behaviour uh, or incredibly complex patterns. Mm. I, I should say. So yeah, I, I, there's um that inf that's the part that fascinates me is is this this new ability, let's say that 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 comes online. Not not just the kind of the in that there's new information or new a new world to explore. But that I myself am new in a way to explore it, and uh, yeah, I just wonder if do you have any sort of thoughts on 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 that, on what you know, what is happening with these abilities that that come online. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of people describe um, what appear to be um, what Terence McKenna and Dennis McKenna used to describe as impossible objects, mm. things that are not just strange uh, or difficult to understand, but that things that are actually impossible that could not possibly exist uh, in our universe, in our three-dimensional plus time universe. And so that hints towards the, the kind of structure of this space, that it might be some orthogonal dimension that, that actually does. It suggests that our, our little universe is kind of a very thin slice of a, of a high dimensional structure. So in alien information theory, I talk about, uh, I bring it down to the 2D plane and the idea of that if someone's living in a 2D plane, like a flatland world, um, then if they suddenly got access to the third dimension, um, you know, if their brain suddenly became two, the three dimensional and effectively, um, it would be, it would be completely confounding. I mean, it would be, so this is, this is, I, 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 I could never have imagined this. This is that this doesn't make any sense, and it would be you know, astonishing and shocking and horrifying in equal measure uh, for them to experience this. And I, 
I, I get the feeling that that's what, certainly in my case, uh, and in many other people who smoke DMT and take DMT, uh, is this sense of the impossibility of it. It's not just highly complex. It is, uh, it's impossible. There are impossible structures within the space. They, they see all sides of objects at once. Uh, they see objects that seem to possess many more dimensions than the normal three-dimensional structures that we're familiar with. Um, um, and, and it's impossible for them to uh, even comprehend uh, what these structures are. Uh, and so that's why I, I suggest, in, or I explore in some depth in, in early alien information theory, is this idea that we are indeed, our reality is a thin slice of some higher dimensional structure, but many more dimensional structure. And, and what's happening when you, when you smoke DMT is effectively you are becoming, your brain, you, you get the emergence of this hyperdimensional brain, basically. Your brain becomes part of this higher dimensional structure for a brief time. It starts to receive information from these orthogonal dimensions. So it becomes, uh, you, you, your brain becomes a five or six or seven dimensional object from your own subjective perspective, mm -hmm. at least. Of course, people in this reality still only see the three dimensions, you know, of your head. You know, if they could open your skull and look at your brain, it would still look like a 3D brain. But of course, it's actually receiving information from these, 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 these orthogonal dimensions, so dimensions that exist effectively at right angles, if you like, to the three dimensions of, of, of our space. Um, so yeah, that would explain why people tend to feel like they are indeed entering uh, a high dimensional structure, because they mm -hmm. are. If, if I'm correct. I, I just wanted to, to uh, go back to, because you, you mentioned uh, Terence and, and Dennis McKenna there and, and sort of their talk around the, mm. these impossible objects. And often they would refer to them as you know, objects singing themselves into existence. And I'd, I'd wonder yeah. what you could just, yeah, if you could just pick your brains on what you think of the, this, you know, you've talked about resonance. There is, there does seem to be this relationship between sound and this experience. So t very typically sort of, you know, codified within like the shamanistic practices of people are singing to the experience and um, mm. manipulating the experience uh, in a, you know, in a variety of ways and for a variety of purposes through through channeling the singing and uh, you know there's a the famous example of uh terence and, and dennis doing this trying to to, to literally like, break reality by conjuring um yeah something yeah. into this universe which would just just yeah collapse collapse the entire program um mm. but that then does have this kind of roots in this uh in this traditional aspect and i just wondered like where does uh, from from the science point of view where, where do you sort of brush up against that or collide with that because there is, I, I, you know, there is something about these uh, what's going on in these traditional experiences where you think, yeah, these guys are onto something. This does, this this seems to me that it, it's it's interacting in a way which is more than just pleasant sound. Um, so so mm. yeah, I, I think when you get into the the hardcore study of something like like DMT and as you're saying, you know, uh, trying to come fully prepared to attract. Um, you know, the guests so that we're not just throw, throwing a stick at them and trying to like, oh, you, you know, like we, we're like, hey, no, we're taking this seriously. Does that factor in anywhere to, to, uh, to, to what you're researching? I mean, it's not really my field, but I'm certainly open to the idea. I mean, certainly sounds, they, sounds enter the brain. They are, they are affecting neural activity. When you hear something, of course, you, that's what's happening. Your brain is being stimulated by, by these sounds, uh, and certainly the brain is is very much a an oscillatory structure. It it generates and is regulated by a large number of electro uh, electrical um, oscillations, uh, which are very important in maintaining certain patterns of activity. It's important in regulating the timing of activity and, and, and partitioning activity. Um, you know all controlled by these short and long uh, wavelength oscillations that are going on all the time in the brain. And so certainly I'm open to the idea that in the DMT state or any, any state really, um, that you can, you can use perhaps the correct frequency of sound wave and that will affect the, the ongoing um, changes in neural activity that's also being uh, elicited by, by the drug itself. Um, but 
Um, I don't know if there's been that much. I mean, certainly there's studies of like binaural beats, mm. right? Um, the idea that we can have, we can separate the frequency of a slight difference between the frequency and your brain kind of um, um, fills in the gap and you get these these new oscillations being generated. So that's certainly being explored. But like academic studies looking at how sound modulates the psychedelic um, state, that would be really fascinating to see. But I don't think anyone's done yeah. it. Uh, I think we're a little early in the psychedelic renaissance for people, uh, certainly kind of mainstream academic types, to be um, to be doing these kind of experiments. But certainly, yeah, I'm open to the idea that that you could manipulate the psychedelic state in a reproducible way. And it might help, actually, to control um, the DMT state. I know certain, some people say that certain sound frequencies for them, or even kind of vibrating chairs and things uh, at certain frequencies, helps them to kind of lock in to a certain state, into a, you know, um, into a certain area, perhaps, of, of, of the DMT space, or uh, helps to stabilize the state in some way. Um, but yeah it, it's uh it's, it's a field of research that's not really taken yeah. off yeah i just think it, it would be some way to connect these worlds together because I, I think i mean i i was when i started getting into all this kind of stuff i was kind of very dry and skeptical as to all the stuff i was kind of just coming at it from a purely you know wow this this is an amazing experience kind of view and then uh, you know, I'm almost sort of embarrassed to say, but I did have these kind of like spiritual experiences where I th where I kind of recognise, oh wow, there is there is a state here that, as human beings which is accessible, which we we could call spiritual, and and I kind of I got what these people were talking around who were coming from that angle, and that was a that was a jarring for me because I was like I, I was a diehard like militant um, Richard Dawkins chomping atheist at that point, and I, and I still am, uh, and I, 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 absolutely I think Richard Dawkins is awesome. Um, but I love it. But I had to. I had to sort of re rewire my worldview a, a little bit, and so I, when a lot of these things, like the stuff of the, um, you know, the the healing sort of aspect, the the singing aspect, the mm -hmm. traditional aspect, this kind of these, you know, what people talk about, it was sacred. There is something there, and I I wonder I, certainly from my you know talking with uh, with other sort of scientists and being at other conferences, it does seem like like the, the the attention is firmly on the like the effect and the experience but not so much like the the human experience and i'm wondering if something's kind of like getting left behind the in the sort of in the kind of the look at um just yeah just just what's kind of ha happening in, ter in terms of these worlds so do you i mean do you have sort of do you um these kind of do you look at it as a kind of a, a use the term like technology before like I would use the term as like it's a kind of form of like spiritual technology. It's a kind of soul technology. Um, it's it's more it's more than just sort of cognitive stuff going on. So, yeah, I just wonder if you had any thoughts mm. around that. Well, I I I often get criticised for focusing on the the more uh, not really out there, but the kind of the alien stuff and the idea of you know the alien worlds and. Um, but that's just because that's my that's that's what that's what makes me itch, as Alan Watts used to say. Uh, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's what I'm interested in, uh, and that's kind of become my niche is to think about um, the more, I guess, science fictiony. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a new vampire of DMT. <laughs> yeah, maybe something like that. Uh, but I don't. I don't. So I've never written about. Uh, traditional ayahuasca usage, for example, except, except in passing, mentioning mm -hmm. it. <laughs> so I'm certainly doing a disservice to it. And, and I think there are plenty of people who are very interested in ayahuasca and are interested in you know, the plant spirits and the traditional use, usage of ayahuasca uh, and the, you know, the ethnography of, of ayahuasca and the, um, the, the types of beings that these indigenous people when they use ayahuasca meats uh, and that's all very cool stuff but it's it's just kind of not my field i think and then there's the more academic scientists well that's the wrong word um the kind of the more modern 
um, hard scientists, if you like, rather than the more kind of anthropological scientists who are very interested in, in clinical aspects now. And that's become the main thrust of psychedelic research. And, and reasonably so, I think. I think psy uh, psychedelics will be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. as, as they're developed, they will become you know, revolutionary treatments for you know, treatment-resistant depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, all that kind of thing. So I understand that. Um, but I, I'm kind of in a something of a, a privileged position in that I'm, I'm not attached any longer. Um, I've cut the final thread of academia, so I'm not affiliated with a university anymore. Um, I'm not um, restricted in that way. I don't have to find mm -hmm. funding, um, for example, to do my, my work. I, I think and I write and I generate ideas and I think about possibilities and I talk to people like you about them uh, and I write about them, I write books about them, I write articles about them, I write tweets mm -hmm. <laughs> about them, <laughs> um, these kind of things. So, so th that's, that's how I see my role, really. Uh, I'm not, I, I, I maintain this, this thread that's firmly attached still to academic science uh, whilst kind of exploring. It's like astral projection, right? You know, the, the, the silver cord that attaches you to your body. So that silver cord is attaching, sorry, it's a terrible analogy, but it came to me. Um, it's that cord that's or one foot, I'm keeping one foot in the scientific arena whilst exploring these mm. other domains. Uh, and that's, that's kind of how I see my particular role here. I'm not one of these new ages or people who just go off uh, and, and can, you know, anything goes like the plant spirits or the, the spirit world or the astral plane or all of these new age ideas that they, they are, they don't have a scientific underpinning. It, it, they have a mystical underpinning, mm. which is fine. I sure. don't have a problem with that. That's not my thing. So what I'm able to do is, is use the sign, maintain a, a scientific underpinning to everything I write about. So actually, this could be true. Mm. This could be true. Uh, have you thought about this? What if this is the case? This doesn't make sense. We can't explain this. What could be the explanation? Uh, and then I talk about several explanations, some wilder than others. But I'm, I'm in no danger of someone going, oh, we're going to cut your funding because the, you're, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so, so I'm, I, I'm completely free in that sense and that was always the plan was to cut myself out of the academic world after having milked it dry <laughs> having milked it all I could get out of it right I've learned all the stuff you know I, I, I'm, I'm proficient in neuroscience and in pharmacology and in chemistry and, and you know other things uh, so I've got everything I need I've got all the equipment and the tools um, the cognitive you're tools. playing four-dimensional so chess with them and know, know that you've beat them Andre you're, <laughs> you're completely free but I actually think, I mean, with with, um, with at least with some of the sort of tr traditional guys I talk to, I actually think that, that your work aligns completely with them. So I think I think it's just a linguistic thing. Um, what they're calling spirits, mm. we're, we're calling aliens, and um, what yeah. you know, we call it hyperspace. They call it the, the planet of the spirit world. But you know, I, I've talked to these guys yeah. who talk about yeah UFOs appearing in the jungle, and and it, it, it's interesting, particularly with your work around uh, extended state DMT, because that's kind of, you know, in some way, that's what these guys are doing. You know, they're taking or drinking all these MOIs. They're doing ayahuasca like every night. And so they're, they're kind of putting themselves into a state of an extended state of DMT. And I appreciate it's a different thing to what, to what you're doing. It's mm. not, the, not the same. There's other things at play there. But it does mean that you end up in a place where you start having to relearn a different reality. And um, they kind of and they just kind of see, oh, yeah, well, sometimes just aliens appear. And that's... That, that's just what happens in, in the jungle. And so, yeah, I, th I think that there's a lot of, uh, of common ground there. Um, but I, I can certainly understand your position of, of yeah, that you, you, what you're doing is a different thing. And I, I, and I did see on one of your videos that you do get frustrated when there's kind of, um, you know, people comparing like the extended state DMT to like, oh, why don't, why don't have you never heard of ayahuasca, Andrew? <laughs> and um, yeah, and I, and I would agree these, these are different things. But I did want to... Um, Ask a little bit, like, cause, because obviously ayahuasca is one way of, of getting these kind of extended states, but then there's these other pharmaceutical ways. And is, it, is mm. that when you get some of these pharmaceuticals, which are apparently quite clean in, in the MAOI effect, mm. 
is is that would you see that as something different? I, I mean, I, yeah. Let me. I'll ask a question, then I'll look backtrack a bit. Is that something different to your extended yeah. state DMT? And first of all, can you explain what extended state DMT is? Because I don't think we've done it yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Okay, I'll explain what extended state DMT is, and that will lead us on to the mm-hmm. first question. <laughs> We're going to go backwards a bit. Um, yeah, so so basically, the din- the normal DMT experience, which is traditionally, well, not traditionally, but in the modern era at least, is smoked, mm-hmm. right? Vap- vaporized. Shouldn't be smoked. Uh, vaporized. But it lasts about five minutes. Uh, what happens in the brain, basically, very quickly, levels rise in the brain. They They reach a peak, which is very high. Uh, it's normally about five times higher than ayahuasca. So there's mm-hmm. the first difference uh, in a breakthrough state. You break through, you're in there. It kind of s- stabilizes for a minute or so, really, and then it starts to come down. And as it comes down, you pop out of the space again. Um, so it's very brief, up and down. This is its pharmacokinetic mm-hmm. profile, and this has been measured. Um, so what DMT does um, is it it reaches a concentration in the brain very quickly, uh, then it's cleared very quickly. Uh, it also, it doesn't have subjective tolerance, which means you can inject someone repeatedly with DMT uh, and they will have the same effect each time, you know, spaced by tw- 30 minutes or something. And Rick Strassman did that study in the 90s. So we know that. So basically it occurred to me that if we want to extend the DMT experience um, longer than five minutes or so, um, we need to maintain a stable brain DMT concentration Uh, and that is uh, routinely done not with DMT but Mm -hmm. in anesthesia Uh, so anesthesiologists they use a short acting anesthetic they have a machine hooked up to your 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 veins and they deliver this programmed infusion rate of drug into your bloodstream the idea being that it reaches your brain and it stabilizes you maintain this anesthetic drug in the brain and then they can push you deeper into the anesthesia bring you into a lighter anesthesia and at the end they shut off the machine Uh, and so it occurred to me okay we can use this same technology um, just as long as we have blood data for DMT we know it's pharmacokinetic profile uh, we can design the same protocol but for DMT instead of an anesthetic drug it's a very simple idea really so that's when I wrote to Rick my friend Rick Strasman who you've also heard of of course um, who did the study in the 90s, and I said, Rick, I've got this idea. Do you have the blood data that I've seen in one of your papers? I saw a graph in your paper, the level of DMT in the blood over time. Do you have the original data from the subjects? Fortunately, he had it tucked away in some Excel file somewhere. Uh, so we started there. We then collaborated. I did the modeling, um, and then we, we generated this pharmacokinetic model. We basically, proof of principle, we showed, yes, this is possible with DMT, and we published it. Um, that was in 2015, mm-hmm. 16 now, so a few years ago. So that's, that was kind of my input. So, so the subsequent people have then taken up the idea and actually started implementing it now in humans, which they're doing with um, at Imperial College particularly, have, have just finished their first trial of DMTX for 30 minutes. Um, it's kind of a small study, but hopefully they will be extending that. So that's the principle of DMTX, you know, bringing someone to the DMT space for as long as you want, an indefinite period of time, uh, by maintaining a stable brain DMT concentration, pure mm-hmm. DMT, no mal inhibitors or anything like that, and being able to control the level of the state over time. So it's very different. It's much more precise and controlled than ayahuasca. So even with ayahuasca, yes, it stays in your b- b- body and brain a long, longer period of time, but it still goes up still plateaus and it's still kind of come down it's not the same and it's normally much lower and it's normally accompanied by uh vomiting and shitting and you know other kind oh of yeah you, you don't have to tell me I, I always have to take plenty yeah. of spare underwear uh, with me <laughs> but um yeah i mean i, I just yeah. it reminded me what i had actually had a a, a, a sort of friend like a sort of someone who was who watched a few of my videos and got in touch he was trying to recreate that same effect but by creating a kind of gas mask <laughs> or connected to a series of thermal pads uh wired up to a timer so yeah. that it would do like every like five minutes one of these timers would go off and using like sort of a arduinos or something would heat one of these pads and just feed something into the mask much less precise i, was, I, I don't think he actually ended up going <laughs> going there with it but he was a bit of a bit yeah. of a, a, a mad inventor but uh but yeah yeah, masks are a bit dangerous, I think. Putting masks over your face 
is always unless you, unless you're an anesthesiologist, an, an expert in getting the oxygen yeah, exactly, mix yeah. right, you can end up you'd be dead pretty. You'll be on the DMT in the DMT world permanently. Yeah, I think it was a famous case okay. of uh, someone who appeared on Hamilton's farm Kapir, wasn't it? The, the person who was big into um, xenon gas and they, they'd kind of got the mix wrong and that sort of resulted mm. in a fatality. So yeah, kids, just don't don't put DMT yeah, gas yeah. masks on. But uh, in regards to the kind yeah. of like the cleaner uh, MAOIs, so you would you would see that I, mm. I, I grant the the profile would certainly be different because you wouldn't get this kind of like fasting fast out mm. uh, thing. But the ex, the experience, like I say, the plateau of the experience, would you see as that that has been different with a like say a pharmaceutically clean MAOI and delivered in a pre- fairly precise dosage with subsequent precise dosages of of, of DMT. Would you see that as a different experience? Yeah, I mean, it's it's somewhere between ayahuasca and DMTX, mm. I think. Uh, and you are, to some extent, stabilizing the state, uh, but but it isn't the same. You don't get the same level of control because you're relying on um, absorption through the gastrointestinal tract, which is variable. Um, well, it could it could be done with with a vapor getting in, I mean, yeah. so you could. You, you could, you could, yes. I mean, certainly some people actually, as it's kind of an aside, use, um, smoke these Hamala, Peganum mm. Hamala seeds, um, like a bowl of these, these, um, Peganum Hamala seeds. Syri- Syrian the name in English. Or... That's the Latin. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Syrian Rue. Uh, um, before, like 20 minutes before. They smoke DMT and then they smoke DMT and then the experience lasts for you know thirty minutes to an hour. Apparently, it's very it very intense. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. So I'm not saying that this is the the only way to do it, but it's the most regulated and easily to control, easy to control uh, technique. I think it seems like the pinnacle of what we're able to achieve in terms of drug administration technologies, yeah, um, rather than relying on you know, using Mao inhibitors and stuff. But certainly someone at home who wants to explore the space, um, then I think the best tools, you know, we have some great tools now that have been largely discovered by kind of citizen scientists, you know, these um, these DMT nexus um, people, um, you know, these uh, like mm-hmm. e-liquid vape things now, the vape, the vape pen, right? I think... You know, if you if you do that well, you get a good quality vape pen and you dissolve your DMT in a good quality uh, e-liquid. This is a very efficient and clean way um, to use DMT, and and you can actually control it as well. You know, you can take small or large hits. You can keep hitting. You don't have to worry about open flames and glass pipes and yeah. setting the house on fire or anything like that. It's a very safe way of doing that. Uh, and then if you mix that in with a a Mao inhibitor of some sort. Um, you know, it could be Syrian Rue or it could be um, a, a pharmaceutical Mao inhibitor, um, then you can actually spend a, a longer period of time. I mean, it's not quite as well controlled as DMTX, but it's the same idea. So so I'm not against, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for people exploring different modes of administration, different ways of taking DMT and using mm. DMT. I think the thing with, it, with the vape pens, it, it does tie into this feel of, technology like oh this is i am engaging with a piece of mind technology through this piece of um you know vaping technology and it is just so much more efficient Mm. and um yeah convenient than the old kind of like yeah glass pipe very easy to burn very easy to to yeah drop it on yourself and burn a hole in the couch and stuff like that so uh, it does it does map very well i think onto the experience um and yeah, f- I, from a convenience point of view, I think they're 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 amazing. It's it's so much easier to use. I've, I've got a, quite a large collection of these uh, these vaping tools, and yeah, they're uh, I, yeah. I'm, I've got plenty of videos on my, on my channel uh, gushing about how uh, how useful I find them. Um, so I just want to kind of to come back a little a little bit to then you kind of your the idea of DMT as this kind of form of test. Um, and uh, there's a couple of couple of bits that I found interesting there. There was a quote, I think, let me just find the quote. Yeah, here we go. So it's, I think this is from uh, Alien Information Theory, where he's saying that all humans are destined to become fully immersed within the grid. And also that it was only humans so far who have uh, achieved this 
uh, this technology. Now, I, I would totally agree in terms of all the humans who are vaping DMT, but um, I would, and I'm going, you know, diving a little bit into my my own experiences here. Then, one of the experiences which which I've certainly had and I've, I've heard commonly reported is that the the feeling that not only are you in communication with sort of um, higher dimensional entities like the you know the DM the the elves whatever you want to call them I'm not big on the elves uh, language but um, but but those those entities but that also other mm. living conscious systems are present and the, and the way I kind of um, imagine this was as a DMT as a kind of and I'll, I'll go back to our early 90s um, analogies here, internet analogies, is that it felt, feels to me like a kind of an, an AOL chat room for consciousness. It's uh, kind of, if the kind mm. of the, the problem being that consciousness is, is so diverse, distances between galaxies are too vast, um, I have trouble, uh, not, not that I spend a huge amount of time trying, but, you know, communicating with an ant in my backyard, never mind a being on, you know, Tau Ceti or something. So... That that really there needs to be a, a something which is can make ev sort of conscious systems meet in the middle somewhere, and that technology that enables that and the space that is generated, the virtual space they generated is the DMT realm, and so yeah, I kind of wanted to just just kind of I don't know when it, when I was I, it did seem that like there was a little bit of human centricity there in, in in your work, and and I was I was wondering like yeah, do you, are you do you see I was wondering I guess. Is DMT the exclusive route to this thing, or is it just one of many routes? Again, which still fits into the model of it being a test. But certainly, I, I've had the feeling like I've, I've been encountering plants and dolphins and intergalactic bumblebees and all sorts of weird mm. stuff in there. I'm just wondering if any of that kind of came across in your own experiences. Um, yeah, I think I so that part of the book I'm talking about. Yeah, DMT is this intelligence test. The idea that that it is a message that's been implanted in this high high dimensional digital mm -hmm. reality and that's what the whole book is leading to and the idea that there is some aim to humanity if you like there is there is some goal that that, that our the reality we're experiencing now is some kind of game mm -hmm. this huge cosmic game and that um that it might be possible to to go from a temporary um, entering over the DMT space uh, into something more permanent and there, there might be this I mean this is where I'm again I'm not talking about my beliefs this is where I am really just pushing my ideas and saying okay mm -hmm. let's take this let's take this where it, it leads you know and this is one direction it might lead the idea some people have described it as an as, as ascension effectively that the humans will ascend into the the celestial realms right and there's a lot of kind of echoes of, of, of certain religious ideas there. That wasn't mm. intentional. Um, Peter Sjostedt Hughes, wrote, the philosopher, wrote a critique of my book and he said, he pointed out that it was, it was just, it was like the, it was a Christian narrative, basically. <laughs> the idea that, that we're going to um, ascend, ascend into heaven at some point and that, that life on earth is this series of tests. Uh, and that, that never occurred to me when I was writing the book, not consciously anyway. Um, but I, I get the feeling that there's a, a strong sense for for me and for for most people, many people when they take DMT, uh, that this place is home mm. in a way. It feels like you're returning home. Uh, it's a place where you've been before, but you don't remember when. There's this powerful sense of déjà vu that's kind of unshakable, this sense of, you know, deja vu, deja vu. Uh, it, and, and there's a comical ambience there. There's, there's, a, there's, there's all these different qualities, but there's a sense that you're being drawn into this space, that they're, they're kind of playing with you. They're, they're kind of saying to you, do you mm -hmm. get it yet? Do you get the joke? You know, have you worked it out? And it's like, well, maybe not yet. And you go away again and then you come back and it's the same thing. Uh, and so the culmination of that, in my opinion, uh, is the when we do get the joke, when we do get what it's all about. Uh, and that then might be the catalyst for our for permanent transference uh, in the book. Um, I call it, what do I call it? Uh, <laughs> resolution, like the resolution of the game. Um, the, the, the different stages, information, complexification, yep. emergence, 
Well, I forget them now. It's, uh, I, yeah, I've gotten the contents of my own book. But anyway, uh, but this final stage, the resolution of the game, you know, you, you, we, we go from the stage of recognizing that it is a game, learning how to play it and what the, the ultimate goal of the game is, um, and then that final stage is resolution. This is when there is this um, transmission um, of our the the informational structure of our of our consciousness mm -hmm. of ourselves into permanently into this higher dimensional uh, realm. So we would kind of transfer ourselves permanently mm -hmm. into the DMT space. But that's just I, I certainly don't believe that that's the case. Um, but I'm just exploring. You know, the world is stranger than we can suppose, as uh, as Terence McKenna often sure. used to say. He was he, it wasn't his phrase originally, but anyway, um, uh, or queerer than we can suppose. And so I think we need to be supposing more uh, and thinking about possibilities, not just you know kind of complete science fiction, uh, but having some kind of thread through it that is at least linked to. Uh, what we know about DMT, what we know about the brain, what we know about the structure of our reality, uh, then we start to think, okay, what what could this all be leading to? What what is the what are the what are the possible explanations for what mm -hmm. we're dealing with here? Um, what we're dealing with here with this this very very curious molecule, uh, and and the narrative that I expound in Alien Information Theory is just one possibility. It's my vision of reality. Uh, it's not um, my belief that this is the way this is i found the secret i never trust anyone that tells you that because they're universally bullshitters right definitely so never agree do that make that clear <laughs> absolutely you know so anyway i don't i don't have any time when people tell me this is actually what you know people often fight with me not fight physically but um yeah, don't they fence with me on social media and stuff. yeah yeah i say oh you've got it all wrong about actually actually this is what dmt is mm. this is what it's doing um, and I, I don't have any time for it. I, I rarely even engage because anyone who tells you they, they've got a handle on what DMT is um, and what it means and, and its relationship between our world and their world, anyone really tells you they understand that, know that. Um, well, not only don't. that, I, I think they, um, they completely missed the point of the, you know, mm. uh, that, that to me is one of the kind of the points of DMT. I mean, again, to quote Terence, you, you really don't know shit and... It's kind of it's humbling to yeah. be reminded of that, and it's so boring to to, to have the answer to to the you know <laughs> oh it's it's this I would just find so tedious I'd, I'd be disappointed. So I think yeah, having all these different um, uh, possibilities is I think again that's not to I totally agree it's not to like you believe everything and so your brain just you're so open minded your brain falls out of your ear but. I think there there are there's certain tantalizing yeah. threads that you that it it's, it kind of calls upon you to pull on like oh look, look at this is a little bit of juice here that you, you can uh, that's it you can get to things mm. and just to come back to what mm. you said around um, the experience of familiarity I remember the the first time I had it I felt stupid I felt embarrassed that I didn't realize it was going to be like this that it was like of course it's mm. duh of yeah what what else were you expecting it's of course it's going to be this hyperspace carnival which yeah and like you said the, the feelings of deja vu were just um yeah i mean it, it's it's it, almost overwhelming mm. and it, that, i mean i'll to come away from this kind of like idea of like what do you believe but i, I can certainly I, I can share what i was told do you want and again i doesn't say i believe it but you know it does conjure up these kind of ideas of that you know we have been here before we are we, that we are kind of scouting now mm. and that's the kind of the purpose of our human life is to scout out and report back and that's the kind of the, the re-upload of, of information back into the, that that is the transition basically the, the end of our human life is that way that so rather than sort of like there being a what's that thing that that, that lots of americans believe in that sort of when Jesus comes and you all start floating up to the sky, um, the kind of ascension. It, oh, is it seventh? I don't seventh know, they, they've got to work it, haven't they? Where you, where you all no. ascend and um, I can't remember. Oh, the oh, you're talking about the. Yeah, yeah. The, the... Oh God! Everyone shouting at the screen now. Come on, it's obvious. And um, the the Jesus the... floaty. It's called the Jesus ah. floaty. That's not. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. You mean like yeah, at the end of the some world, sort of, right? Some sort of event. I'm sure when, it's like when, 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 uh, geez, where they call. Yeah, yeah. Calls everyone. The okay. <laughs> Let, let, yeah, let, let's not, let's not back undermine us, yeah. our own yeah, our brains just collapse out now trying to think of this but, but that anyway the, the floaty up to the sky uh, religious-y thing where yeah, and all, all the bad people get punished and all that stuff so yeah ra- rather than being oh, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of um, event I think I'm gonna, probably going to wake up about 3 o'clock in the morning and start screaming like <laughs> so um, yeah so rather than that happen maybe it's just yeah that, that's, that's the that's our life cycle you know we return back to the the collective uh integrate our sort of uh the, the knowledge that we picked up and i i, I yeah, yeah i think I've so. certainly had that 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 narrative you know, i think me. it makes sense right well there's there certainly feels like there's this this very strong although it is so strange so bizarre so unlike our world um it, and yet it feels like there's a very strong sense that we've been mm. there before as you say and so so it is perhaps possible or you can imagine that that you know we we come into our world we pop into our consensus world for a very relatively brief period of time and then yeah. we go back you know so we're just kind of like a like a dolphin leaping out of the water right uh, and then phew, it comes back down into it again. That's kind of what we, we're like dolphins. We're popping out into this reality, uh, this little game. It's a lot of fun. It's kind of strange. Uh, and then we go back to the mother reality, if you like, which is far bigger and far older. Also age as well. I find that the DMT space, although it's it's very advanced, it's it seems like it's very, mm. very old. Um, this is This is a place that hasn't just popped up, popped up in the last 50 years or something this is a place that has been around forever you know much much longer than our uh, our little universe it feels like this is a very very old and grand and deep and highly developed place um um much yeah, more I think, than our I think world. that's why it ties into so, so the, all that. Yeah, kind of it ties into that very, very. I think mm. that's why you do get these strong sort of indigenous ties. So when you have these cultures of, of people who have such a focus on lineage and, and tradition, inheritance, that mm. that feel does very much come across. And this is like, yeah, this is this is ageless. It's timeless. This is like the, mm. even like what is happening. It does not fit in, in like a sort of a linear time. This is just an event that is now sort of recorded in the sort of akashic records or whatever you you know you want to call it it's just knowing the strata of, of, of the uh of the universe so yeah it definitely uh uh you know all, all those kind of different features are all tying together and there's one thing though mm-hmm. which, which i think maybe you know, coupled with this subject i read somewhere in your uh i'm pretty sure it was in your book anyway talk around prenatal dmt like as in that this is a so do, does that yeah. then lend towards this feeling is that where the kind of the this comes in before and again purely on, a, on an opinion based thing but it is is it because this is like a there is a womb based memory of, of of being off her tits on dmt or well this is what i speculate in 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 the book as well is that that we know that certainly in in smaller mammals that dmt is produced in much higher levels um until about just a few weeks before birth, and the levels start to, to drop. Um, and so it, it seems possible, perhaps, that in humans too, that in, in the, the brain of the neonate, that they, DMT levels actually, um, or the brain of the fetus, should I say, not the neonate, that's the baby, right? Is that the, yeah, that's the baby. Yeah, uh, oh, the brain of the fetus um, might contain higher levels of DMT than than when you're born and so you're kind of uh, in in that in the gestational period uh, your brain is actually experiencing it's start it's tuning in it's starting to learn again it's starting to learn how to construct this alternate reality mm-hmm. before it has to start building the normal world when when it, when, it, when you leave uh, so that would fit in as well and so so then it really would be um real not just deja vu but actually yeah. a true memory you really have been there before uh, but um, before you could actually form proper memories or, or at least ex- memories that you can recall you know you can directly uh, uh, retrieve um, so that would make sense I think so I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm open to that idea that we, we came from 
in, in perhaps a very real sense, uh, the DMT realm, um, in that we were experiencing the DMT realm when, whilst we were in our mother's womb, uh, we weren't experiencing information from you know this environment but we would we would the brain was already constructing this mm -hmm. alternate reality um you know still connected if you like in some way to the dmt world and then we finally sever those that cord uh, that sever that connection when we burst into this reality a few months later yeah. and uh, and and dmt levels drop and we start absorbing information and start learning to construct this reality so that's, you could probably that go at it from, from the other angle, like if you want to be a bit far out and you could. So assuming that there is some kind of like universal collective and that we are going to fragment off to inhabit this gestating infant, mm. uh, then, yeah, maybe that's like, OK, let's, let's start. We'll, we'll start smoothing the road. We'll, we'll use a simulator. So they put the DMT in so that like, they'll, that's the inroad for the, for the branch of consciousness to slip in. And that's like, OK, there's a bit of VR stuff going on. And that's like, OK. Are you ready for the full implant? Here we go. We're going to cut off the DMT supply. Yeah. And then we're, then we're kind of doing the opposite yeah. to, to the that's interface. It. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's it's, it's, So I think there's there's different levels behind. We, we see one side, if you like, of that. And we, we, you know, we can measure the DMT levels in the brain or imagine DMT levels in the brain. But there's the other side as well. Um, that's some of that connection to the other reality that we we can't we can't even understand how that works. We don't understand the interface between our reality. We don't mm -hmm. even understand our own reality, right? We don't even understand the structure of our of our consciousness, where that comes from, uh, and the structure of our universe. And um, so we certainly don't have an idea of how that interface works. If there is an interface between our reality and some other reality, you know where where that other reality is and how is it connected? What is what does the connection look like? I just don't think we have the tools. We don't have the, the language. We don't have the technology. We don't have the sophistication um, yet to actually, you know, I, I do a kind of uh, uh, a kind of a sketchy attempt in alien information theory to how it might work, how that information can uh, be gated mm. by DMT. Uh, but we don't really understand um, how that interface you know, might do, do work. We, do we have an understanding um, but, on yeah. Go on. The rapture. rapture. The, the rapture. rapture. Be beautifully recalled. <laughs> How could we forget the rapture? Yeah, I, I was thinking it's ascension, asc ascending. But no, it was the rapture. <laughs> Thanks to our, our, yeah. our Christian friends. Yeah. Um, in regards to, to the, the, do we have an understanding of where this prenatal DMT appears from? And I guess this then ties into this thing around like, which concept pops up around endogenous DMT. Is is that no a, a thing? Is that sort mm. of? Yeah. It's for sure, it comes from tryptophan. So, um, so all of the tryptamines in your body. So the main one, of course, is serotonin. Um, uh, serotonin comes from uh, tryptophan, which is a, an amino acid. It's an essential amino acid. It's also you know, tryptophan is kind of cool. Uh, it has the the indole ring, right? You know the indole ring of tryptamine. Mm -hmm. So you've got like a six-membered ring, then you've got a five-membered ring with nitrogen. This is indole. Um, so that so tryptophan is tryptamine but with a carboxyl a co2h carboxylic acid group so that's amino acid tryptophan very common um then you decarboxylate it you remove that in the body there's an enzyme that does that uh, and that gives you tryptamine then where do you go from there well you can add a hydroxyl group at the uh, an oh group uh, on the five position on the ring and that gives you five hydroxy tryptamine okay. which is serotonin um Alternatively, you can add two methyl groups, two carbon atoms with hydrogens on the, uh, the amine, on the nitrogen, on the chain of the tryptamine. That gives you dimethyl tryptamine. Um, so, so all DMT in the body comes from tryptophan. And tryptophan is kind of a cool amino acid because it it's, appears to be the last of the amino acids to evolve. So to appear in the world, the last one ever was tryptophan. Um, which is kind of interesting. Also, it's the only, and Dennis McKenna pointed this out, uh, every amino acid is c uh, encoded by what are called codons in the DNA. So you have three, like GG, mm -hmm. GGA, right? That's glycine, I think. GGG is glycine, TAT or ATC. Uh, and um, each amino acid will have a number of three-letter words that code for it. Now, there's only two amino acids that only have a single word for them. Uh, one of them is methionine. That's the starter 
amino acid. So it's the first mm-hmm. amino acid in any protein. So it makes sense. There's only one word for that. That's the kind of very fundamental one. And then the other is tryptophan. Uh, all the other amino acids can be coded. They have um, uh, encoded by different um, combinations of, of, uh, of bases. Um, so that's just a, an interesting quirk that tryptophan is kind of stands out also in its structure as well, having this, this strange indole ring. It's a curious um, molecular motif, structural motif in the molecule. So yeah, tryptophan is kind of cool and cure, and also leads you in to thinking about, um, and it produces so, so DNT. Is this something so, you think that we yeah. could tap into then? Because uh, there's all these various exercises and stuff for people who, who claim to be able to stimulate sort of DMT production within within the brain. and tap into the experiences is that um i i must admit i've been somewhat skeptical of those things but it, is this is, is this a, mm. like I say, is that a thing is it a possibility you think or is it just is, is yeah just what's your take on it i think it's it might be possible i'm always somewhat skeptical when people tell me that they you know they can generate dmt in their brain through breath work um, a lot of people claim that they they have DMT experiences. Now, if someone has a DMT-like experience, does that mean they're generating DMT in their brain? Mm. Not necessarily. Um, is it possible? Maybe. Uh, we know now that, or there's a very strong hypothesis that DMT is uh, is upregulated. Levels are increased in the brain quite rapidly in response to hypoxia. So when there's a lack of oxygen. Um, a DMT is produced, and we think, uh, or it's hypothesized by people like Dennis McKenna and uh, a guy called uh, mm-hmm. Ede Fresca, um, who's working on this, that DMT is actually protective against mm-hmm. cell death in response to hypoxia. So when you're when you when you when ox- when your brain is starved of oxygen, low concentration oxygen environment, brain cells start to die, and then you die. You have a massive stroke, uh, and then you you know you stop living. Um, so DMT, it's been shown actually protects cells, ner- nerve cells, neurons from cell death in a low oxygen environment. Um, so then you start to think, oh, okay, so maybe when you're yeah. dying, as your you know your your heart stops beating, um, this DMT is being produced, and it's actually. Um, should you come back to life, it's protecting the brain. This kind of brain. justifies the like, near-death experience. And then you think, okay, of... this justifies the near, near-death experience, right? So, that, so it's kind of cool. It fits in perfectly now, right? Then you think, okay, where does the DMT come from? Is it produced by the brain? Um, we know that uh, the enzyme, the key enzyme, uh, it's a methyltransferase enzyme, the enzyme that puts those two carbons on the nitrogen to make DMT, is found in, in the lung. The lung has a very large surface area. It's also, of course, obviously, it's it's, it's uh, closely related to the sure. um, the oxygen transport system, right? The gas diffusion, that kind of thing. So it might be a good place to put um, a an oxygen the, a system that would detect when oxygen levels are dropping or when the respiratory system yeah. is starting to fail, um, uh, and then perhaps the lungs are producing DMT. Um, large because the lungs would be capable of producing large amounts in a relatively short period of time. The pineal gland certainly is too small to be pumping. Um, oh, and, Andrew, you, you just ruined the entire video now. This is this, uh, all the, the comments are filling up with, with <laughs> hatred now. Right. Don't you dare talk about my pineal gland. I know. Dr. Gallimore. <laughs> I know, I get it all the time. You know, I need to decalcify yeah. my pineal clearly, <laughs> Def- defloridate it or whatever. Uh, yeah. But so it's probably not the pineal. And Dave Nichols um, has done the calculations on on how much it would need to produce to, to generate enough to create an NDE or to actually protect the brain. Um, and it's it's almost certainly not um, the pineal that's producing it. It could be other cells in the brain. You know, other cells in the brain would be perfectly capable. So the brain itself, the the larger the cortical structures might be responsible for producing the DMT um, yeah. or it could be the lungs, right? So then if you say, okay, maybe it's the lungs, then you think, okay, can we generate this state? Can we manipulate the breathing so as to mimic this um, hypoxic state without actually you know, depriving the brain of oxygen, mm. the breathing techniques that could generate and then lead to production of DMT? Okay. Maybe. 
um, Wim Hof yeah. thinks that DMT is produced when you do his breathing exercise. I mean, he just kind of, I think, made that up. Or, I mean, he believes it may be, but I don't, no one's ever tested it. And it would be quite easy to test, uh, to monitor some DMT levels in someone's blood whilst they were doing you know, certain breathing techniques, whether it's Wim Hof, Wim Hof, whatever, or, you know, Stan yeah. Groff's holotropic breath work or other, other types of, um, um, breathing techniques. Um, I don't rule it out, but I've not seen any convincing evidence that people are consciously able to stimulate the production of DMT. In yeah, it would be very cool, cool if they could. I think it's just yeah, one of those things where it's, it's the, yeah. it, it kind of bugs me a little bit because the, the language has just become so, um, kind of fashionable that, that everything is dmt you know and it's like uh, you know I, i've had people trying to say oh yeah you can yeah, yeah yeah you can do like certain close dive visual techniques and it's like you get dmt visuals I'm like dude you've, you've clearly not seen dmt visuals like no, like no it's idea. not a mushy you know it's not a colored light yeah colored, colored lights very cool that ain't what happening you know so yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so i'm also no, no. skeptical about people being able to like no. meditate themselves into into dmt states it just yeah, I mean, I don't know if these people are actually have used mm -hmm. DMT as well, or whether they they just imagine this is what DMT must be like because they maybe they see bright colours and maybe they have what you know quite a, uh, a, an amazing experience that seems psychedelic. But unless they've actually taken DMT, they know exactly what the DMT state is. I don't know. You know, is the brain somehow able to recreate um, the DMT state in the absence of DMT? Um, under certain mm. conditions, maybe um, it seems quite difficult for it to do so. It really needs that perturbation by this molecule to actually start the the kind of reconfiguring of its world building. Yeah, and I think that, that that's not to take anything away yeah, from yeah, those meditative states, states before idea. before they all, all those people sort yeah. of go nuts in no, the comment section. Uh, but yeah, I, I just think there's there is there is mm. something specific. There, there is a certain specific effect where you can point to it and say that is that, and it's not just the same as um any other insightful or profound or um yeah trippy trippy experience um i am i am conscious of, uh, yeah, yeah, of, of, yeah. of the time andrew um i did just have so i'll, I'll let you uh, get off soon but i did just have a couple of uh, quick questions from some of the people in my community that they, they asked me to ask you um so mm. these might be a little bit sort of uh mm. more specific than mine let me just pull them up so there was um one in regards, which I think you actually answered earlier, um, um, from database was asking, he's really interested in if, how long you've been able to maintain a DMT dosage via IV and whether it has any impact on later dosages. A few years ago, the plan was a 25 milligram bolus plus 4.2 milligram drip. Has that changed? Um, so yeah, it, I remember seeing a talk of yours, like for, I think it was about mm. six years ago, where you're just, your face was lighting up at the prospect of, of having people in this state for hours or days or something like that as a but you mentioned mm. i think 30 minutes earlier is, is, it, is that the maximum that you're aware of yeah i mean of course i'm not doing the experiments i always have to tell people that you know i'm don't write to me and say can i volunteer i i, I live in japan i don't do human dmt work here um so so it's in london yes imperial college so they so the, the protocol that me and Rick produced was really a back of the envelope calculation really in scientific terms it was it was not designed to be taken kind of straight out of the box so to speak and used in humans so the Imperial College team um, did a much more detailed analysis in collaboration with a specialist pharmacokineticist guy a guy an expert on drug metabolism uh, and built a much better model than myself and Rick were able to able to produce uh, and they they're using that um, the the actual infusion rate and all of that stuff mm -hmm. is not available yet so as it will when they publish the paper so they finish the first kind of trial with a limited number of people of over 30 okay. minutes really just to test at different dosage levels the different levels of experience um, and presumably um, I asked him a few days ago but I don't know yet exactly when he's going to publish this but then the protocol will be out there um, you know, people, I mean, I don't imagine people are in their homes are going to be setting up these infusion devices. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> we'll all, we'll all yeah, be knocking them together into like Coke bottles. Yeah. and be, Like we used to make bongs out of, out of like all manner of things when we were kids. So yeah, I dread to see some sort of like uh, Frankenstein uh, infusion devices. 
things that'll be it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, these infusion devices, they're not, they're not expensive at all. No, no. I, mean, I should, probably shouldn't say that, but I mean, they're, they're, it, it's, it's how you use them. You know, I mean, syringes obviously aren't expenses either. And these infusion devices, they're not complicated. It's, it's a box attached to, you know, it's got a little calculator basically in it where you program the infusion rate, uh, you know, and add uh, a cannula into someone's arm. Which needs to be done by a doctor, and then or a nurse, and then. Yeah, I, th I think I'm going to start a GoFundMe so, yeah, request think, after this video too. Yeah, buy me an infusion machine, everyone. Yeah. everyone send your donation. <laughs> Maybe three or four hundred dollars would get you an infusion machine. So it's not it's not crazy okay. crazy. Um, the, the next one um, was um, probably quite a big question. So I don't maybe you could give the the, the head the small version of the the quick notes. My question for Andrew Gallimore is, yeah, the elevator. does he agree yeah. with Penrose's view that consciousness is more than a computation and it cannot be replicated algorithm algorithmically? <laughs> Just in a sentence, Andrew. <laughs> um, I'm not going to second guess Roger Penrose uh, on, on, on questions of computability of consciousness. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't. From what I've read, I mean, Roger Penrose is is extremely, I mean, Nobel laureate in mm -hmm. physics or in math, was it? Yeah, mathematics and physics. Um, so Penrose is a very smart guy. He's not a very good communicator, unfortunately. It's very difficult to understand him sometimes or what his point is. I've, I've been to some of his lectures and he's spoken about his theories of consciousness. Um, he uses like acetates. Oh, know, wow. like, like from Overhead 19, projectors. Early 90s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got a projector, like a flip thing. He's got an acetate. It's kind of quite cool to watch. Proper old school. You know, he doesn't have, you know, PowerPoint or Keynote or anything like that. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, all handwritten, you know. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've been to his lectures. I've, I've read about his orchestrated objective reduction or whatever it's called. Uh, or OR theory of mm -hmm. consciousness with Stuart Hameroff. Uh, I've never, it's never struck, I've ne I didn't read it and think, oh my God, this is it. Um, I read it and thought, mm. um, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't see no. the explanatory power of it. I don't see what it explains. Um, the idea that these quantum events inside microtubules are creating consciousness uh, or something. I'm probably misrepresenting the theory entirely. But anyway, um, maybe I don't understand didn't, it properly. Didn't ring your bell. In short, I don't know. I avoid consciousness uh, directly. Uh, I, I avoid the discussion of consciousness directly because mm. I don't know what it is. I know that we all, I have it. Uh, but nobody, you know, it, this is still a, a philosophical question, right? What is consciousness? Is it emergent? Is it fundamental? Um, does it, does it, is it produced by the brain? Is it transmitted into the brain? All these different questions. I avoid it because um, um, I don't take a particular position on it. My position is always the informational structure, the content, the dynamics of your mm. world is represented in your brain. Why is that informational structure, why does it have a subjective quality? Why, 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 is, why does it feel like something for the brain to be building those structures? I never get into that uh, because I, I simply don't know what consciousness is or how mm -hmm. it's generated or where it's from. Um, there we go. And then I think uh, the last one, <laughs> it would be a bit of a more of a generalized one. Um, what is your opinion on the kind of the psychedelic renaissance the legalization the ex the expansion of psychedelics and, and the fact that people are now going buying 400 dollar infusion machines based on on what you've just said so <laughs> um, yeah what 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 as it's in terms of like the phenomena of what's happening um and yeah i mean happening on many levels just pe first of all people being able to find these things thanks to things mm -hmm. like the internet um the way that's happening the the legalization good thing bad thing any anxieties around it like what, what's your thoughts? I think it can only be a good thing. I think the the concern, I mean, certainly I'm a cognitive liberty kind of guy. I, I don't think any any government should be controlling what you put into your body. They shouldn't be controlling what states of mind or states of consciousness you uh, are and mm -hmm. are not allowed to access. Um, I think that's an ab absurd idea. Um, so certainly legalization of these molecules is 
obviously a good thing. It's, it can only be a, uh, a good thing in principle uh, for cognitive liberty, for the right to enter whatever state of consciousness we want. Um, are there concerns? Sure. Uh, you uh, Certainly people are concerned about the uh, the commodification, if you like, of psychedelics, um, of you know, every day you seem to see some new patent being filed for for some particular mm -hmm. use, and people are concerned about that. And there's there's one I won't mention any names, but there is there's one or two quite large academic groups that are making a point, or that are seem to making a habit of patent trying to patent. Uh, every every everything they do, ways of using psilocybin, strange variations on drug delivery, um, just trying to find, trying to make um, make it novel so that they can get a patent on it and restrict other people doing it. You know, I think they wanted to patent using psilocybin in, with music or something. You know, in a therapeutic yeah, setting, certain, certain configurations certain of coaches and soft play sort of things. I'd say, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That this is now a patented setup. So, so obviously there are concerns there, um, and and that's only going to intensify, I think, as, as as psychedelics become much more mainstream, particularly as um, as as mm -hmm. psychiatric treatments in in, in medicine, you you're going to see that that tension between people wanting to make money. Um, by patenting certain molecules or certain processes and, and those that have a more altruistic approach who actually want to, to help people and, and have these drugs available to whoever needs them. Um, so you're going to see that, I think. I'm slightly separate from that because I, I'm not into so much the clinical aspect. I don't talk about that. I'm into the stranger aspects. I think there's always a danger that when you when something like DMT does become kind of saturates the mainstream it does become extremely available mm. you're going to start to see scare stories people you know particularly when people can buy these vape pens you know onto the, on the internet for but for very little and it's, so it's it's so convenient now for people to, to access dmt and, I, and everyone should have the right to access dmt of course but um, you are going to see more scare stories you're going to see headlines of you know these danger drug you know student goes crazy after smoking these uh, alien alien <laughs> alien crack or whatever they'll, they'll give it some well, that, that is no his name uh, that is, <laughs> I'm, I'm alien crack <laughs> we're gonna roll on. well they used to, that nitrous they call, used to call it the newspaper oh, used what? to call it hippie crack and i've oh. never i never heard anyone call it hippie crack but the newspapers you know nitrous oxide also it reminds me did you ever see the episode of brass or? eye where it was taking the piss out of uh and they're, and they're like yeah cake yeah, and all the <laughs> cake, all the yeah. names that they came up for them and you can almost imagine some of these things getting into the media <laughs> yeah, and, yeah like, I, I can't remember some well yeah exactly, hippie crack and yeah, alien crack. yeah so so you know it, it, <laughs> alien crack so you can imagine a, you know some negative very negative uh, publicity for alien crack dm also known as dmt um and and mm. that doesn't help it's not good when 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 it gets a lot of negative attention so so i think there needs to be a continued effort to to, to let people know to educate yeah, yeah. also education, i think it, it, of course. it it has a kind of people, you know, there's like a an additional strand to the negative pr because i think like it, there could be something similar to salvia salvia at one point was very widely available and has these mm. very similar reality switch yes. effects, but just kind of became known as the wacky mm. thing that teenagers are acting like bellends on. on. And I think for, for DMT to, to inherit that kind of label, I think would, again, it, it would kind of miss the point somewhat of, and sort of turn people off to the, to the possibility of it because yeah, nobody wants to be the screaming teenager on the floor telling that they've been eaten by intergalactic caterpillars or something. Yeah, I think the good thing about I mean with Salva, yeah, it was there was a brief period where every day there'd be a new YouTube video or it'd pop up on my Facebook of oh my god, watch mm -hmm. this, the wildest Salvia trip and they'd you know be hundred X <laughs> or something, take a bong of it. And they'd start doing crazy things. But I think with DMT, although it is just in many senses as intense as, as Hydo Salvia, uh, you don't people don't normally act out on DMT. It's normally they look like they're 
sleeping, even if they're having the wildest experience. Uh, they don't tend to. Um, they tend to be somewhat paralysed almost. Whereas with mm. salvia, people actually start to act out and do kind of crazy things. So, so that maybe is a little bit in, in DMT's favour. Uh, but these things pass, you know. Um, they pass through. They become a little f- flash uh, of publicity that you get, and they become a, a kind of a cultural moment. And that might happen with DMT. Well, one thing's Maybe sure, it's already happened. we'll be, we'll hopefully, um, we'll both be know. around to find out and see how this plays out over, over the next coming decades. Um, I'm, yeah, I mean, you've been very, oh, very, sure, very yeah. generous with your time, and yeah. just want to give you a job. Is there anything you want to point people towards? Uh, I'll, I'll just do, I'll do the shameless plug again. Yes. Yeah. So please, uh, Reality Switch Technologies. This is my latest book, which is the. Um, I can confidently say it's the most detailed and comprehensive guide to how psychedelics work in the brain, available anywhere in the world in any language. It's in English. Um, all classes of psychedelics, um, the classic psychedelics, DMT, psilocybin, etc., plus things like ketamine and uh, the tropane alkaloids, as well as salvia. Uh, I talk about you know, how how they interface with the brain and how they change the structure and dynamics of your world. So please do buy this. It's on Amazon. Uh, it's also on my website, alieninsect.net uh, or buildingalienworlds.com. You can find um, my books there. Um, also, follow me on Twitter. Of course, it's, <laughs> Twitter's still alive. Alien Insect. Um, I post on there quite regularly my kind of ideas and thoughts about psychedelic so if you want to kind of more of a stream uh of my my thinking then follow me on uh twitter and my youtube channel also alien insect i have a whole course free course on psychedelic neuroscience which is i think there's like 70 videos or something like that eight units um so yeah if, if people want to learn about how DMT is actually working in the brain and other psychedelics working in the so, brain. There. I, I would just so, add course, that... Uh, that's it. Um, reality Switch Technology is not mm. just in English. It's also it's in English and Japanese. And I've had some, a lot of fun <laughs> sitting with... I've, I've had an intimate bit. relationship with my phone and Google Translate, trying to, to pull the, the, the sort of the, the hidden message, out, which I, I actually realised. It reminded me a lot of kind of... Um, Fan, sort of Final Fantasy game books of like, oh, what, what's the extra sort of extra stuff? So I, I, yeah. I do really love these kind of extra yeah. level, the, the, the extra mile that you go with the the layer to these books, I think is, is really great, Andrew. It really is an experience reading them. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the, for the work you're doing. I've re- very much enjoyed uh, talking with you. Like I say, go and check out all your stuff and yeah, leave it there, mate. Thank you very much.